Qualifying for the Belgian Grand Prix at Spa is over and it's Max Verstappen who was the fastest driver of the day and Charles Leclerc in the Ferrari will be starting from pole position. But what did we learn? Well, in today's video, I am going to be doing a data analysis from qualifying. If you enjoy the video, then please hit the like button and subscribe for more F1 content. Now, let's get into the video. As usual, I'll be talking about the top teams later on, so please do stick around for that. Yep, qualifying is over, and it was one of the trickiest sessions of the year. Rain was starting, and then stopping, and then starting again. It was impossible to predict what was going to happen. Essentially, it was a classic Spa weekend, and as mentioned, Max Verstappen in the Red Bull did take pole position. So let's look at the lap times that he set during the session, so we can see just how things changed between each qualifying session. And when you look at these laps, you can see that in general, lap times did get faster and improved during the session. The lap times actually improved by 3 seconds from the start of Q1 to the end of Q3. But at the end of Q2 and also Q3, Verstappen was actually unable to go faster as the rain increased at the end of each session. Let's now compare Max Verstappen's pole position lap time to the fastest lap from FP2 set by Lando Norris in the dry, so we can see just how the conditions really made for a tricky qualifying. And when you look at these lap times, you can see that immediately that some of the corners which are easy in the dry became much more difficult in the wet. And also, of course, DRS was not active in Q3. Therefore, the straight line speed is obviously down. In FP3, Norris reached a top speed of 337 kilometers per hour. In FP2, Norris reached a top speed of 337 kilometers per hour. But in Q3, Verstappen only reached 317 kilometers per hour. Also through Lacom, look at how much more speed Norris was able to carry. At this corner in FP2, Norris carried 212 kilometers per hour. But Verstappen only managed to carry 179 kilometers per hour, showing just how much less grip there was in qualifying. At the apex of Puan as well, Norris was 22 kilometers per hour faster. And then at the slower speed corners of Fanier and then the two Stavolo corners, Norris gained 3 seconds on Max Verstappen. At the end of the lap, Norris in FP2 was 10.8 seconds faster, showing just how much less grip there was in qualifying today. Let's now take a look then at the straight line speeds that the teams were able to reach. This can give a very good indication to the amount of downforce that the teams were running because they didn't have access to DRS today. And what can we see when we look at these top speeds? Well, when you look at the top speeds, you can see that we saw a very different order to usual. Haas were still very quick as they managed to reach 320 kilometers per hour, but they were not the fastest team in a straight line for once as that honor actually belonged to Alpine as they reached 323 kilometers per hour. It looks like they did sacrifice some downforce compared to other teams as they are usually one of the slower cars in a straight line. Red Bull and Mercedes, it seems, have opted for higher downforce as they were down on their straight line speeds, which is going to make tomorrow very interesting when Verstappen is trying to come through the field. So we have seen the top speeds, but then in the midfield, what teams impress? Well, for me, like I said in practice, the team that were very impressive today was Alpine, as Esteban Ocon today qualified in 10th place and he will be starting in 9th place, and Pierre Gasly could have gotten through to Q3, but he just missed out, but he's still starting in a very good position. In the race, it will be very interesting to see if they can keep this pace up. They look to be lightning in sector 1, which might actually make them tricky to overtake, but for Alpine, there is a lot of negative news surrounding the team. So hopefully for them, they can keep this up and they can finish well and score some points just to try and shut out any of the negative news surrounding the team. If they can score any points, it will be very positive for them. I just want to say that if you are enjoying the video so far, then I would really appreciate it if you hit the like button and subscribe for more F1 content. Now though, let's get back to the video and let's talk about Mercedes. For Mercedes, it was a good session for Lewis Hamilton, as he will be lining up in third place on the grid, meaning that if he gets a good start, then it is very possible that he could be leading by the time they reach Lacombe at the top of the hill, as he can tuck into the slipstream of Leclerc and Perez and then get a great slingshot up Eau Rouge. 
Teammate George Russell qualified down in 7th place, but he will be starting in 6th. It was not quite as impressive from him, but still for Mercedes they can be very happy with this performance. Let's now compare the times set by Lewis Hamilton and George Russell. And when you look at these two lap times, it seems like Mercedes pair have actually gone for two different levels of downforce, as George Russell looked to have a top speed edge into Lacombe and also Blanchemont, but teammate Lewis Hamilton had the advantage in the slower speed corners, which you can see at Rivage and also Fania, and then again at the final chicane. In a fully dry race tomorrow, it is going to be very interesting to see how these two different levels of downforce are going to affect the two cars over a race stint. Hamilton could be looking good through the corners, but down the straights he could be vulnerable to the McLarens behind, and he might find that overtaking is not straightforward for him. For Ferrari, it was a fantastic day for Charles Leclerc as he will be starting the Grand Prix from pole position in what turned out to be the surprise of the day. He was the only driver to improve really in the final lap and he was rewarded. Teammate Carlos Sainz however had a very scruffy final lap and it did fall away for the Spanish driver. We are going to compare Verstappen and Leclerc shortly but for now then, let's compare the lap time of Carlos Sainz and Charles Leclerc. And when you look at these two laps, the lap for Sainz is almost instantly undone, as he doesn't get a good exit from La Source, and then that almost immediately ruins a lap. He did claw back some time at Lacombe at the top of the hill, but then through the slower speed corners, Sainz struggles for traction a lot more than teammate Leclerc, as Charles gets a great run on the run to Puan, and from there onwards, Leclerc starts to just slowly open up the gap against Carlos Sainz. This, in the end, leads to Leclerc beating Carlos by 7 tenths of a second, and Leclerc has set himself up very well for the Grand Prix. It is going to be interesting to see if Ferrari has gotten over their high-speed bouncing issues. If they haven't, they could be in trouble. But if they have, like I did think they had after practice, then this could be a good opportunity for them to try and score back some points against McLaren. For McLaren, it was a disappointing day really as Norris qualified in 5th place and Piastri was 6th, so we'll be starting 4th and 5th. But for them, they were a long way away from Red Bull and Charles Leclerc. Let's compare the times of Piastri to Verstappen. I would compare Norris, but for some reason his qualifying data is glitched, so I can't really access it at the moment. And when you look at these two laps, you can see that the big advantage for Red Bull comes in Sector 2, which would make sense as they did opt to run with more downforce in qualifying. On the run towards and through Puan Corner, as we've seen all day long and all weekend long, Verstappen was in another league compared to Piastri, as Verstappen managed to carry 8 kilometers per hour more at the apex. Through this section alone, Verstappen gained 6 tenths of a second. Going into Sector 3, Piastri did gain a little bit of time back on Max, showing how the McLaren was a little bit stronger in this session. In the race tomorrow, I can see McLaren being in a great position, and we should see them beat Hamilton, and we should also see at least one of them on the podium, if not both drivers on the podium. Finally, for Red Bull, it was domination from Max Verstappen as he dominated the session, but will be starting the race from 11th place. Red Bull were looking very strong, and you could argue that this is shown by the fact that Perez was 3rd place today, and he will be starting the race in 2nd place. Let's now compare then the fastest lap of Max Verstappen and compare it to Charles Leclerc. And when you look at these two laps, there is actually very little to tell between them when they reach Lacombe. Verstappen just had the edge, but like I said when we looked at Piastri and Leclerc, the advantage really opened up in Sector 2 at the slower speed corners. Leclerc, however, was able to carry more speed at Puan compared to Piastri, and you can see that by the fact that he was only 3 km per hour down on Verstappen, as opposed to the 7 or 8 by Piastri. You can see how Ferrari had slightly less downforce than Red Bull as well, as through Blanchemont, Leclerc started to close a gap to Verstappen, but still, Verstappen was in another league. In the race tomorrow, Verstappen will be using all of that grip in the corners, to try and make his way through the field as quickly as possible. So with that in mind then, what are my predictions for the Belgian Grand Prix? 
I actually think this is one of the most difficult races of the year to actually make any predictions for, but I'm going to try and do that anyway. In P5, I'm going to go for Sergio Perez in the Red Bull. P4, I'm going to go for Max Verstappen in the Red Bull. P3 will be Oscar Piastri in the McLaren. P2 will be Lando Norris in the McLaren. And yeah, I'm going to take a bit of a punt on this race and go for Charles Leclerc to win the Belgian Grand Prix. Although I do think that could just be me being on Dream Street because I'm not sure Ferrari does have the race pace. But I'm going to go for them anyway because this season has been chaos. But those are my thoughts. The question is though, what do you guys think will happen? In the comment section down below, please do let me know. And as always, comment, leave a like and subscribe for more F1 content. Thank you all so much for watching.